There are four ways of looking at the small bowel. You can look at the terminal ileum through the colon. You can look at the small bowel during an operation called intraoperative endoscopy, but that requires laparoscopy. You can use a peristaltically driven long sonde endoscope, but that takes about eight hours. The quickest, easiest, and best way of getting a look at the small intestine is with a dedicated small bowel push endoscope. The push endoscope is about two meters long, longer than a colonoscope, about the same size as a video gastroscope. It's extremely easy to insert through the mouth and pharynx, stomach and small bowel. It's frequently used with an overtube, although that's not necessary, and fluoroscopy can be used for its positioning. This is the equipment used for push enteroscopy. A bite block to keep the scope and the overtube from being bitten. The overtube, flexible, has a special end on it that allows for increased flexibility. It has radiopaque markers at the tip for radiographic localization. The enteroscope, two meters long. We backload the lubricated overtube on this before we start. It's fairly easy to do. As long as the overtube is well lubricated, we then snug the overtube all the way up to the end of the instrument and leave it here until we want to insert it into the patient. Once the overtube has been snugged up to the scope and is on the end of the instrument in its proper position, we now have as much instrument sticking out of the overtube as if we had a regular gastroscope. So we can use the tip deflection capability of the enteroscope and perform a regular gastroscopic examination on the way down. We can examine the stomach, esophagus, duodenum perfectly adequately with this instrument without having the overtube in the patient. It is important to use a bite block all the time during small bowel push enteroscopy because the patient being sedated and having a long instrument placed down through the intestinal tract may get somewhat uncomfortable. This will keep the instrument and the overtube from being bitten. Let us show you how to work this bite block. Notice the lock mechanism here that allows a spring inside the bite block to close. Even though the bite block is locked onto the overtube, the instrument can still be passed through it with very little difficulty and almost no resistance as long as the overtube has been well lubricated. After having placed the bite block into the mouth, the scope is advanced through it. The bite block is held in position by an assistant during the entire procedure. Introduction of the instrument is the same technique as a gastroscope. Under direct vision, endoscopy of the esophagus, stomach, and duodenum is carried out. The scope is so long that an assistant must hold it at the mouth in order to keep it from falling on the floor. During push enteroscopy, bleeding sources are often found that were unnoticed or overlooked on previous gastroscopic examinations, even when performed multiple times. The sources that may be found vary from hiatus hernia with erosions to the typical watermelon stomach, often misdiagnosed as antral gastritis by endoscopists who are not aware of its typical appearance. Here we are advancing toward the pylorus. Upon entering the duodenal bulb, a small arteriovenous malformation is seen. The instrument is then advanced under direct vision as deeply as is possible until the overtube has been reached. At this point, the tip is in the upper small bowel. The white end of the overtube is seen just outside the patient's mouth. The instrument must be straightened for overtube introduction. The tip is hooked by manipulation of the dial controls and the shaft is withdrawn. Any loops within the stomach are automatically taken out by this phase of scope withdrawal. The lubricated overtube is then advanced. Because it follows the contour of the scope, it automatically comes to rest at the pyloric orifice. Fluoroscopy is not necessary for this maneuver. For purposes of this instructional tape, however, the fluoroscope is in place for the entire procedure. 
Notice that, as the instrument is advanced and the overtube is in place, tip deflection can still be performed even though the instrument is deep in the small bowel. Bubbles in the small intestine can be dissipated by the addition of cymethicone through the instrument channel. It is important to pull back the instrument and use tip deflection often in order to see the contours of the bowel so that a determination can be made as to the location of the lumen. An assistant must be present for the entire procedure to monitor the bite block position and to hold the instrument in place while the examiner relinquishes hold of the instrument shaft in order to move the tip controls. If lumen is not readily evident, the instrument should be pulled back often. This affords a view of the circular valvuli conaventes of the small bowel, which will guide the examiner to the lumen's location. This also straightens the scope, which has an inherent tendency to loop because of the configuration of the small bowel. Once loops form in the small intestine, then an in and out motion may help to advance the instrument. The Olympus SIF-100 is 2,500 millimeters or 250 centimeters long. This is almost three feet longer than a long colonoscope. The jiggling in and out motions help to pleat the small bowel onto the scope. The major limiting factor to deep intubation is looping of the scope in the small bowel. The long scope with the overtube may reach a depth of about 90 centimeters in the small bowel whereas a colonoscope without the overtube may be advanced to about 50 centimeters. The tip of this small bowel enteroscope is 11.2 millimeters in diameter and the outer diameter of the insertion tube is 10.9 millimeters. The bending section on the tip moves 180 degrees in either up or down directions and 160 degrees for left or right deflection. The field of view of this instrument is 140 degrees. The overtube, made of polyurethane with a white Gore-Tex flexible bending section, is 15 millimeters in outer diameter and 70 centimeters long. Total intubation with the push enteroscope should be the goal. This can often be achieved using the overtube since its use eliminates the formation of a large gastric loop. A fluoroscope is used to show the multiple loops in the small intestine. The x-ray demonstrates that the overtube was not advanced through the pylorus, but stopped at the pyloric orifice. It is not necessary for the overtube to pass into the small bowel because its main function is to eliminate the large loop which forms in the stomach during intubation. On the fluoroscopy, the two radiopaque rings of the overtube are of assistance in localizing the placement of the overtube. Even with full insertion, there is still the capability of tip deflection. As the instrument is withdrawn, manipulation of the dial controls allows total vision of the small bowel. Should the instrument begin to rapidly withdraw from the small bowel, it can be readvanced in order to maintain a view of the lumen. The average time for push enteroscopy is about 30 minutes, and most of the time is spent in moving the scope in and out at the mouth to pleat the small bowel onto the scope. The use of this push enteroscope will give the diagnosis of a small bowel bleeding site in many patients who have not had the source of bleeding found with any standard investigations. The procedure of push enteroscopy is so well tolerated that it should be performed before other invasive diagnostic techniques. Push enteroscopy with the use of the overtube has been associated with tears at the cricopharynx and has been reported to cause pancreatitis. This fluoroscopic view demonstrates the current position of the scope as it is being withdrawn. Fluoroscopy is of no value in localization of a specific lesion since there is much pleating of the bowel. In spite of the length of the push enteroscope, the 2.8 millimeter instrument channel permits passage of a variety of accessories to perform biopsies or therapeutic maneuvers. The mucosa may be biopsied, arteriovenous malformations may be fulgurated, and polyps can be removed. Even with full insertion, there is still the capability of tip deflection. As the instrument is withdrawn, manipulation of the dial controls allows total vision of the small bowel. These small arteriovenous malformations were treated with electrofulguration current. When cautery is used in the small bowel, the technique is different from that used in the stomach because the small intestine is thin and easily perforated. A light touch of the bicap electrode or heater probe to the lesion is all that is necessary. 
Here, upon withdrawal, the tip is in the duodenal bulb. The pylorus can be seen during removal of the scope. After withdrawal through the pylorus, the overtube is seen. At this point, the overtube can be withdrawn once the bite block has been released. The overtube may be brought back to its original position at the head of the scope or can be partially removed and withdrawn with the scope as demonstrated here. The pylorus can be reinspected once the overtube is pulled back. It is evident that there has been no trauma to the pylorus from the overtube having rested there during the entire push enteroscopy. As with intubation, an excellent view can be obtained of the stomach, esophagus, and pharynx on withdrawal. During removal, inspection reveals the lack of trauma from the overtube having been utilized for push enteroscopy. The overtube is not absolutely necessary for passage of the push enteroscope. The scope can be advanced without it, but may not intubate as deeply into the small bowel as is possible with the overtube. Well, that's it. That's all there is to push enteroscopy. It's a fairly simple, straightforward procedure that doesn't take very long. It's like a gastroscopic examination, only extended. It's within the realm of any gastroenterologist that performs upper gastrointestinal endoscopic procedures. The procedure is good for those patients with obscure GI bleeding and should be considered early on in those patients in whom gastroscopy and colonoscopy have failed to reveal the source of bleeding.